All right, welcome back to CS160. Sorry it took me a minute longer to get going here. Um, first things first, it's about that time of the semester where uh, we'll start distributing, distributing loaner devices. So we have a variety. Uh, there are the largest device we have is this 8-inch Vizio tablet. Uh, we also have a couple of 7-inch Nexus 7s and smaller phone size uh, uh, Nexus 1s. So the newest device out of the bunch is the Nexus 7. The other ones are about a year and a half, two years behind. So um, you have to decide which device makes most, makes most sense for your group project. Uh, we're going to have enough to uh, loan out one device per team. And if you already have a device that has better specs, you have a, a, a Samsung tablet or a newer Motorola phone or whatever, um, feel free to use that, right? These are just tools to help you succeed in your project. There's absolutely no need, uh, no requirement for you to take one of these if you have something um, better. But if you're on the emulator otherwise, I highly recommend that you do check out one of the devices, just because a lot of the usability issues only become apparent once you run the device uh, with touch input, holding it in your hand. All right, so how are we going to give these out? Well, there's a loaner device survey. Uh, the link is on the wiki for today's class. And um, please find one person in your group um, who, su uh, who submits that. Only submit one per group. And it just asks, uh, asks you for your first and second choice, just so we can uh, gauge the demand. We don't have 22 of each. So we'll do first come, first serve. and. Hopefully you get your first choice. If not, hopefully the second. Otherwise, we'll, we'll work with you to, to work something out. Um, the way you're going to get these is that one person in your group uh, will write a check, which is a security deposit, over $200, made out to UC Regents. And you bring the check um, to us. I'll keep the checks in my office. And if, at the end of the semester, you return your device in working order with all of the pieces, we just give you the check back or rip it up or you know, either one. If you disappear and we get an email that you're now in Mexico <laughs> enjoying your new device on the beach, uh, then we're going to cash that check and from that buy a replacement. It's worth more than $200. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, this this is it's roughly you know with depreciation the value of of the devices um, just as an extra incentive to bring the device back. You should bring the device back if you want to grade for the course, <laughs> or you know let us know if you dropped it, a car ran over it, we'll take your check but give you a grade. But if you just disappear. Um, yeah, don't expect to wait for the course. So that's the basic mechanism. So for now, fill out the survey. Um, we'll probably send out a Piazza message if, if we get enough response by Wednesday. We can start giving out devices uh, Wednesday, either at the beginning or the end of lecture. Any questions about these? OK. One thing to be aware of is uh, not all of them will run the latest version of Android. There's beautiful OS fragmentation um, in the space, and so that may be something you may want to check into. Um, and then, in, a, in addition to the different form factor, right? they also have different features. So the two tablets only have a front camera, not a back camera, whereas the Nexus One has a high-resolution back camera but no front camera. And then, if you want lots of sensing, the Nexus 7 has accelerometer, magnetometer, gyro built in, whereas I believe the other ones only all have uh, an accelerometer. So those are 
you know, features that you may or may not need for your application. So just look up the three models online. You can look up the specs and then decide what makes sense for you. All right, uh, just quickly wanted to recap what we talked about last week on video prototyping because that's your current team assignment. So the goal of a video prototype is really to tell the story of your application where you have full control over the entire story, right? There's no user who will test aspects of the interface you haven't implemented yet. In fact, you don't even need to implement it. You just kind of need to draw the interface out and then do the right amount of video editing. Um, so we encourage you to uh, use images of real settings to set context and then go back and forth between shots of software and shots of context. Um, in video prototypes in general, narration is optional. For your assignment, um, it is required because it'll make your job a whole lot easier um, and our job in understanding what your prototype is if you just tell us while simultaneously showing it. Um, so I just wanted to show you maybe one other example of a, a recent video prototype. This is also done before anything exists. This was from the Microsoft Office Envisionment team. Their vision um, released a year or a year and a half ago of what computing, mobile computing 10 years down the road would look like. So we'll just watch that video for um, a minute or two and then maybe analyze the video pro prototyping techniques they've employed. Ah, uh, that was the wrong thing to do. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Enjoy this ad.
You get the idea. <laughs> now you get the idea of what the video looks like. All right. Now tell me, uh, tell me about the different video techniques um, you saw employed there. Some of them we may have talked about, others we haven't, and what you think worked and what did not work. Uh-huh. So there was maybe a problem with the communication in, in this video where either intentionally or not, you couldn't really see what the interface would be like or what the tasks were. Okay, so maybe this video had a slightly different overall goal than your class assignment. All right. Other thoughts on the video? Yes? They didn't need speech. Yep, no speech. And so when someone said, I didn't get what was going on, right? partially that was because there was no explanation offered as to what was happening. So you get the rough idea of, OK, it's businessy, and I think there's a meeting involved and some travel, um, but without additional explanation, it's really hard to get the motivation of people. Uh, so you may have to actually watch it multiple times um, to get that level of understanding. OK? So maybe narration would have helped. Since it's very, very polished and high fidelity, it gives you the impression that it's, they've, they've already set the interfaces in stone. And so this is what you're going to have to adapt to. So it doesn't really give any clear indication that it's it's personalized other than showing some pictures of you or the people that are around you or your company. It, it gives you much more of the impression that here this is the, this is what your future interface looks like. This is what you need to learn. Uh huh. Yeah. So it's it's definitely ex it's like very high polished, right? I don't know how big the special effects crew was that uh, worked on this, but. Um, one thing that, that is ubiquitous in this video that's going to be actually one of the most difficult elements to achieve for your own video prototypes is everything was animated and kind of tracking the user's finger touch. And that is something that's very labor intensive to do if you do it manually, or you have to write code, both of which are besides the point for your particular assignment. Right, so if you look at what Balsamic offers you, hopefully all teams by now have looked at um, Balsamic and you've started to mock up your workflows. It kind of goes static from screen to screen. So you may want to think about if it's really important that there's some continuous gesture, how to do that without sinking hours into the video editing. So one option is that you take all your Balsamic assets, export them into iMovie, Windows Movie Maker, and just use simple scaling effects and or just move the graphic around. So you get to experiment um, with that. Something else you saw, even though the story wasn't very clear, right? It was always this back and forth between here's the interface, here's the shot where someone uses this interface. Now back to the interface. OK, 
Okay, any other thoughts on the video? I'm not sure if it, if it has any connection to Windows 8 or not, with the, uh, the new interface. When was it uh, made? Uh, I believe about a year, year and a half ago. So I'm, I'm not really sure if it sort of like shows what it will be like or presents the idea. No, this was this was supposed to be you know ten years out. Wow. Uh, notice that what's happening in this video that's a little dangerous um, that I would definitely not recommend for your own project is there are effects that show you interactions that with current technology are not really possible. So there's a morning hotel room scene where projection is appearing in midair yeah. without any screen to project onto. Like, where's the projector? How is it popping up in midair? And so that is something that um, it's easy to be tempted to do in video editing because making things hover in midair is just about as difficult as making things track on a simulated tablet. But it's not actually possible to implement, right? And so um, if, if you get sucked too much into using video exclusively as a way of envisioning, it's easy to take a left turn at some point and come up with ideas that aren't actually possible to implement. And so you should stay clear of that as well. All right, just to um, recap here, tips and tricks for your own video. Um, begin with a title, begin with some narration of what we're seeing and why we're seeing it uh, with an establishing shot, and then switch between UI and live shot. And in the end, you want to connect back to the original motivation. So don't show me that you know, some task was achieved or that you know, some question was resolved. Um, for editing, Keep it simple. Live video is the most convincing. Um, but what can also work is that you take still shots and do either just show the still shot and narrate, or do montages like you see in documentaries, like the uh, famous or infamous Ken Burns effect, right? where Ken Burns, a documentary filmmaker, just takes a still photo and then pans it slowly and zooms, and then goes from one still shot to the next. And that is much faster than shooting the real video, and maybe a good first pass. Um, and really don't obsess over video transitions and cutting and compositing and editing, because you can literally spend weeks on that, and it's not the main point of this assignment. So just tell your story with the minimum amount of editing necessary. A couple of tricks for showing interaction. You basically have three options. One is, um, so when it's time to show things happening on your device, just mock it all up in Balsamic, and then record yourself clicking through. If you go into uh, demonstration mode, right, your pointer turns into a huge, giant pointer, and it's very clearly legible what, what you're doing, what you're clicking on, and what the result is. Um, advantage, you don't need any other editing beyond that. The disadvantage, no animation, no continuous motion at all, only like clicking is supported. Um, the next level up is you export the images from Balsamic and add interaction. A lot of people have used PowerPoint and Keynote because they have some animation features. And then you just play your Keynote file and screen capture that. And there you go, some reasonable simulation of animation. Or you can do it in the video editing environment which is yet more powerful, but also yet more complicated. Um, and the last option, which is also fine, is you can do a balsamic mock-up, and you can print it all out and do paper prototyping from there. Um, all of those are possible. I'll leave it up to you what you think communicates your project idea best. And just a reminder, um, the video prototype is due a week from today by class. All right, finally, there's a mini assignment that should take about three minutes of your time. Um, and that is we've put up a mid-semester feedback form, which is really just like a four-question form 
that asks you what's going well in the class so far, what's going not so well in terms of lectures, the sections, your group. Um, and so take this opportunity to give us feedback both for maybe changing things for the second half of the semester or for future offerings of CS160. This is anonymous. Someone asked, um, how will you know that we've completed it if it's anonymous? We don't. So there are no points for this assignment, but this is your prime chance to give us feedback um, halfway through the semester. So please click on the link, fill it out. It'll take next to no time. All right, moving on. Um, this week, we'll mostly talk about UI engineering. So how interactive applications are um, built in terms of UI components, layouts, and uh, event-driven interfaces. And then on Wednesday, we'll go more into uh, design patterns like model view controller and into issues of threading. So how do you make responsive user interfaces when um, you may have to wait for slow data from the web? and you don't want to block your UI and keep it responsive in the absence of data that you're still waiting for. All right, so let's dive right in. In the beginning, there was the command line. <laughs> <laughs> and um, for the early decades of uh, computing, pretty much all applications shared as their underlying principle a command line dialog. So um, you invoke a command, some computation happens, you may be prompted for input, program waits until it gets that input, then does some more computation, goes back and forth like that until you exit. And really the major shift came in the early 70s at Xerox Park with the Xerox Alto, the first um, kind of fully fledged vision of what graphical desktop computing would look like. Now, here you now had um, multiple windows potentially overlapping, and dealing with input became harder. Input could occur at any time and in any number of locations. Whereas with a, com with a console command line program, input could only occur when you were prompted and only in that particular location. So um, we kind of have the C change from the old model that we still see in, in Unix shells, where interaction is con controlled by the system, and the user is just queried whenever the system is ready and needs some input, to event-driven interfaces, so all graphical user interfaces, where the interaction is really controlled by the user, and the system has to be on standby for input and react to that input. And that just means that um, the way we program such applications and the architectures has to adapt and is a little more complicated. All right, let's look at some pseudocode. So console programs look roughly like this. Do some work, prompt for input, wait for input, process that input, do some more work, done. And that translates kind of one-to-one -one into any console API you find in any uh, language that's still used today. Now, the minimal interactive program is actually just one step beyond that. So we're just going to put everything in the loop and say, wait for user input because the user is now in control. Whenever the user gives us some input, we process it, update the display, and wait for more input. And how do we know what to do when the user provides input? Well, usually there's some case analysis. What did the user do? Did they ask for cut, copy, paste, insert, delete, double click, any of the menu items? So. Usually what you find in early interactive programs is some large case analysis. Now, that mode of programming doesn't scale, um, especially not when you're using 
a windowing system because now we have multiple applications that may be waiting for user input, so they can't block each other. And um, the interpretation of the command also depends on the active window. So you can't have a single giant case statement that tries to disambiguate for all locations on screen what a user might be doing, because you may not know what the applications are ahead of time, and just the cross product between all possible actions and, and Windows um, grows very large. So in response to this, researchers develop UI toolkits, and basically all user interface uh, user interfaces today are written using such toolkits. So whether it's the Android SDK that you're using, uh, which is built on top of Java, or another Java toolkit, such as Swing or SWT, or um, other platform-specific toolkits, such as Coco on OS X, um, or the standard kind of uh, on Windows, you have multiple different choices, um, such as Windows Presentation Foundation or Win32, or different ways. Now, what's in a toolkit? Well, there's a library of reusable interactive elements, widgets. So these are your components, but then also layouts. So layouts and components are what we're going to talk about um, today. And this, these are just frequently used building blocks that someone else has done all the work of implementing them, and you just <coughs> recombine them in ways. But toolkits also define an architecture. And the architecture just specifies how input and output are handled. Usually, this architecture, architecture wraps the main loop for you. So you're no longer writing function main in your program. It's now the UI toolkit that handles that for you. And the architecture specifies where you put your pieces of code that plug into that architecture that are called at the right times. Um, and finally, the architecture also specifies if you're not happy with this library of widgets that ships with it, how you go about writing your own. All right, so what are some examples of modular components or widgets that, are, that we find in user interfaces? Buttons. Buttons, yes. OK, what else? Sliders. Sliders, yep. More. Checkboxes. Checkboxes, yes. I heard something about text. Text areas. Labels. I like the weather widget. So, great question. So there can be more common and less common ones. And usually, a toolkit ships with the, mo the set of the most common widgets, and then gives you, but it also gives you ways to add other widgets that third-party developers have contributed. Um, so here's some examples in Android. There's actually a rating widget, um, toggle buttons, check boxes, radio buttons, text entry, date spinners, drop-down menus. Here's how the Java Swing widgets look like. So somewhat the same set, except optimized for mouse input. Um, and the interesting thing with Swing is that you, know, you can write a UI that runs on many different platforms that will look the same way, because it uses these platform independent widgets that Swing ships with. There's an upside and a downside. The upside is your UI will look the same on every platform. The downside is it will never look native anywhere. Um, and that's why platforms usually ship with a native set of widgets as well. So here are common Windows widgets. And notice that things that widgets define are um, maybe not just the static look, but also dynamic behavior, such as as you hover over a radio button, the radio button may turn a different color to indicate that you can click. And it may look yet different when it's disabled. And how animations look. These, these may all be properties that are defined by the widget set. And just for completeness, here are the, the Cocoa widgets. <coughs> all right. So what's in a widget? So well, 
it's an enca encapsulation of a particular interactive control. Um, usually there's an inheritance hierarchy, so you have a very general component class, and then button, maybe a subclass, and then a toggle button, which is a specific instance of a button, maybe yet be a subclass of that. So standard kind of object-oriented design that is carried through in, into the implementation of widgets. Um, the widget does drawing, so usually there's some underlying drawing library that a widget set relies on, and then input processing and handling, and bounds management. So what's bounds management? It refers to what the, what the drawable area of a component is, and when that component determines that it needs to be redrawn. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. Each component is usually an object that has at least three types of information. There's a bounding box, which just specifies, here's the area of the screen that I handle, where I draw myself into. Um, then there's a paint method. So in Android, this is called onDraw. And um, in Swing, it's called paint. In Cocoa, it's called drawRect. Um, so it's kind of common. And so within the, this applies within the bounds that a component has. You then use the underlying drawing API to just draw your state, and then callbacks to process input events. And these, there can be default implementations of what a component does, and then there can be you know, additional code that you supply that gets called. The graphics model is very simple, but it's usually 2D, start at the top left. Um, we used to measure everything in pixels and define our widgets with bitmaps. And now, as we get into ever higher resolution screens and also a diversity of different uh, screen pixel densities, many UI frameworks are now working in device independent pixels and basically use vector drawing um, calls underneath. So you just call the vector routines, and they render the pixels out for whatever screen you happen to be using. And so the standard API here is really there's just drawing shapes, drawing images, drawing text, and changing, um, changing the attributes of those. All right, sizing. If you write a component, that component usually should be reusable in many different contexts which means it may have to work in many different sizes. And in fact, in most UI toolkits, at the widget level, you are not in control of your size. Instead, someone else up the food chain allocates space and says, you now have 50 by 100 device-independent pixels. Render yourself into that space. So that means your draw routine, when you create a widget, usually has to be able to work with any type of uh, bounds that are passed in. So in Android, uh, the method you would have to override is on size changed, which is called whenever space is allocated or for some reason uh, the size that you have available changes at, at runtime. All right, and with widgets, basically, once again, the uh, principle is make the common case fast and the uncommon case possible. So the common case is you just take whatever components are in the library and you put them together to make your interface. And the uncommon case is that these are not enough and you may need to make your own custom widget. For example, the last time I taught CS160, there was a group that had a beer tasting app. And they found this, uh, from wine tasting, this taste wheel, which is basically a radial menu that lets that projects dimensions of taste um, as spokes. And you would slide your finger along those dimensions to indicate how, how much of a particular taste was present um, in a beer. And so that was a really custom view that didn't ship, didn't exist. So they implemented their own drawing and then their own event handling for, I, for dealing with taps and swipes um, on their taste wheel. So. In Android parlance, what's a widget? 
Well, a widget is anything that derives from the view class. And so if you want to make your own custom widget, you subclass view, and then override, well, drawing, bounds, and event handlers, right? Those were our three components. So you override on draw, you override on size changed, and you override the um, touch event handlers, so touch event key down, etc. All right, a single component not does not make an interface. So the second major topic to talk about in um, you in arranging UIs is layouts. So how do you compose multiple components together? So let's say we just have this really simple interface, which has a label that says you know enter text. Then there's a text area where you can enter text, and then you have bu two buttons, OK and cancel. So what are different options how we might tell a UI toolkit to produce this UI, given that we already have the components for labels, text areas, and buttons? Spatial, yeah. But you're bounded by the window size. Yep. So you right. So you have a window size. So within that window, how do you lay things out? You can do it uh, relative by saying the button like cancel to put at the bottom right corner, then OK next to cancel. And yeah. So you can you can provide relative constraints which says, OK should be to the left of cancel. And both of those should be below the text area. What are other ways in which we may want to do this? Exactly. I can just give you pixel values. right? I can do this in Photoshop, measure at what location which item is, and just provide you that. OK, other approaches? When? You do a sort of a hybrid between the two where you could provide resolution independent coordinates. So you could say, you know, the button the button's going at you know ninety percent of the window height and the text the the window configuration buttons go in the upper upper ten percent and right ten percent so that you can you can change resolutions without having mm -hmm. the, the Right, so changing resolutions may matter here. In general, what you have here is a tension between control and flexibility. So either I give you complete control, such as with this. So let's do an absolute layout. Let's say, well, the label goes at these x, y coordinates and width and height. And here's the text area. Here's its x, y and width and height. And here are the buttons, width and height. So why might this work on an Android phone? Or would it work on an Android phone? Regardless whether the call is there in, in, in the API. The users of Android apps can't like change the window size. So the stuff where you get viewed. Yep. So you can't resize your window. You have a device. So if you know the device type, maybe you should just do absolute layout. Do you have a counter argument or? OK. Anyone have a counter argument? <laughs> There's so many different screen types. Yes. So in the early days of the iPhone, right, uh, before we went to Retina displays, there were a couple of generations of iPhones that had exactly the same screen resolution. And it was the only screen resolution available for your platform. At that point, why not do absolute? It would work. Now, but there are some downsides. Right? It doesn't 
scale or resize well, even flipping horizontal landscape versus portrait mode, you'd have to define two separate measurements <coughs> for each screen. Um, now, for prototyping, absolute layout is great because it's really fast. And that's basically what you're doing in Balsamic. Right? You're just putting things at absolute locations. That's the fastest way to, to lay out your UI. So if there's really, if flexibility is not needed, this can be your first pass. However, for all other situations, if you're targeting multiple handsets or desktop applications where Windows can resize, you need something more flexible. So how do we get a handle on, on managing the flexibility? Well, every UI basically uh, works on the, every UI toolkit works on the principle of a containment hierarchy. So we'll just have a tree of components and the leaps in that tree are the widgets themselves and every intermediate node in the tree is something that specifies a partial layout. So the, and the principle behind that is each container is responsible for allocating space and position its contents. So this panel would allocate the space for its two buttons and then tell the buttons, this is the space I've allocated for you, right? And the higher level panel would allocate the space for the label, the text area, and the sub-panel. And common hierarchical layouts that are in use across platforms are 1D horizontal or vertical lists, 2D grids, and then some constraint-based relative layout. And I'll give you a de demo of struts and sprints. So in Android, this translates into linear layouts, which can be horizontal or vertical, relative layouts, which is what someone brought up, right? So that says, put these buttons below this text area. Um, web views, which aren't layouts at all, because you just <laughs> let you let WebKit, you know, take over <laughs> and say, there's a whole world of a virtual machine inside of that that will then deal with layout, um, and and then there are various. Uh, variation, so for example, the, the grid view. So, just toy examples. A linear layout that's horizontal, but it just breaks the space into um, uh, columns. Now, it gets a little more complicated because a component can tell you, I would like to have at least X amount of space. And that negotiation back and forth between what the layout has available and what a component requests is actually a source of a lot of frustration in, in laying out UIs. Um, you can flip that around so you get a vertical orientation. So for our example that we had of this text entry form, the way to lay that out is you just use two linear layouts, one nested in the other. Right? So your first one is a row-based layout that has the label, the text area, and then a column-based layout that has the two buttons. Uh, just to give you a point of comparison, here is Windows Presentation Foundation uh, on Windows. Looks basically the same. You replace linear layout with stack panel. Um, the only difference is that because we're now on a desktop where you have a windowing system, you already get some default resizing behavior, which you wouldn't get with an absolute layout at all. Now, having this multiple level hierarchy in itself becomes kind of cumbersome to go from here's a finished design to now I've got to map this across multiple different hierarchies of horizontal and vertical layouts. And so that's why uh, there's a, a different class of layout managers um, that is often used, um, constraint-based layout managers, where you position something and then say, and on resize, here's at a high level how components should or should not move. So let me just quickly jump into. Um, a small demo of that. 
if we can. OK, so here we have our same dialogue. And I can, sorry, I'm trying to see what I'm doing. I can bring that up, and I can resize. And you see there's some resizing behavior, such as the text box grows horizontally and vertically. And then those buttons, actually, they only they move vertically. They don't grow at all. And they don't do anything. So that seems to be wrong. OK, so what do we do here? Each element here has, I can define both struts and springs. And a strut basically is an anchor. So if I put an anchor to the right and to the top, then that means whenever I resize the window, we're always going to keep the default offsets to the right and the top um, of the window. But then I also inserted these springs, which means if I grow, right, grow the region as the window resizes. And now if we look at these buttons, the button here is defined as from the top and the right. And there are no springs at all. And that's why when you grow the bot, uh, when you grow the window to the bottom, the button didn't move at all. So instead, we could anchor both these buttons to the bottom. And that is probably more the behavior that we were looking for. Based uh, layout managers give you some intermediate level um, of control between saying, here are some things that should say fixed, so they behave as if they were in an absolute layout. And here are some things that will grow dynamically, and you have control over how they grow. And so this is how um, most of these desktop UIs are usually built with one of these constraint-based layouts because they're more flexible. All right. Um, last point is that layouts are these days specified in one of two ways. Um, and that is actually a result of the web as a platform taking over. Um, not too long ago, all UIs were basically specified like this, in just the underlying Turing complete language. So you would instantiate a container object, a layout object, and then add components to it whenever your application started up. What we see much more nowadays are basically declarative languages that just specify the layout of an interface. So there's HTML, obviously. There's uh, XAML for Windows. There's MXML for uh, Adobe products. Um, there's their own XML dialog that Android uses. And they're all roughly equivalent, right? Where you, where you just, the containment hierarchy is now mapped directly onto the XML tree hierarchy. And you have both layout and widget nodes. Now, there, there are visual tools that help you build GUIs for both approaches. Um, so there are GUI tools that let you lay out things and then generate this underneath the hood. Um, except there's a problem in, there's a round trip problem. When you generate this code and you're in a Turing complete language, you can now type next to anything here, right? You can open a network socket, connect to a database. And you usually, if you make extensive edits in this format, it's impossible to go back to a visual representation of it. So if I now start adding loops in here, where my loop stopping condition is set at runtime, I don't know how to show you a UI version of this. And so the declarative model is more restrictive, 
but at least there's a nice duality that holds between visually editing the tree hierarchy and giving you the XML. However, there's a catch. And that is that all of this declarative UI specification is static. And so if you want to change how your UI looks at runtime, you're basically always back in this model. So if you want to dynamically add rows to your interface or another column based on how much content you loaded, you usually have to do that by dynamically creating containers, adding them to your interface. And now you have the overhead of mentally dealing with both this representation and the static representation. And so for common cases like loading a grid of images from the web where you don't know how many elements there are, basically developers of the toolkit have already gone through that pain for you. And these now exist as, as abstractions. But be prepared if you have a custom case, you will likely find yourself uh, writing procedural code to generate layouts. All right, moving on from any other questions about widgets or layouts to compose widgets into UIs. You guys are good? All right, then let's talk about events. So an event is just the abstraction by which UIs model all user input. Um, so input gets described as events, and then applications handle different events. So what are events you've dealt with for your first two programming assignments? On click. On touch, yep. On drag. On long tap. That's an interesting one because it's kind of at a different level of abstraction. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about timing as well. OK. So mouse and touch pen get modeled as events. And there are different events for different um, states, right? Mouse entered, exited, moved, clicked, dragged. Um, and then there are inferred events, so events that you have to kind of write code over the event stream and make a decision that something happens, such as a double click, where you have to take into account the timing or the long tap, where you've only seen a tap that hasn't released yet. And it's then up to you to decide that's a long tap because some threshold is exceeded. And there are keyboard events, and there are sensor events, right? like location changed, accelerometer data, um, magnetometer data for your uh, compass orientation. Um, and then you may also get other events on resizing the window, on size change, which we talked about for, uh, for custom views in Android. All right, so what's in an event? Well, it encapsulates all the needed info. So that is, what's the type? And what component in your UI generated that event? When did it occur? Are there any modifiers? So that may be um, that you held the button down while you tapped on the phone, or you held the modifier key down on the keyboard while you clicked. Um, and then the content, right, x, y location on the screen, which button was pressed, which was the key code that was pressed. And those events then trigger callbacks. So for a slider, you may get a first event callback when a cursor just enters over the slider. Remember how touch devices are different from mouse devices? On mouse over doesn't exist on a touch screen device. Because the first thing you'll know is the click or the touch down. So then there's, um, and a click may generate multiple events, right? So you, there's maybe a difference in listening to mouse down versus mouse click, which is down followed by up. Um, and then you may get yet other events for, for dragging. So the main idea is that you can just attach pieces of code to respond to any of these events happening over a particular component. Now, 
Now it actually turns out you don't get all events. There's there are a lot of things that happen before you, as someone who attached an event listener to a button or who wrote a custom view, gets a callback notification of an event. And so here's a this is the Apple Coco event handling guide, but um, you know other OSs look very similar. Hardware events come into the kernel and then get may get filtered at subsequent levels of the operating system before they ever get to your application. So can you think of an event where you perform an action with a mouse or a keyboard that'll never get to an application? Let me think about that for a second. So something that the OS will filter out for you and do something in response to. Yes? Control-Alt-Delete. Yeah. Excellent example. Control-Alt-Delete. Um, so anything that's a OS-specific shortcut to access some functionality, um, there'll be a listener at the OS level that you will never get to see, and those, those keyword events will just get filtered out and never get to you. Other examples of that nature that you can think of? The Windows key? Yeah. Volume up, volume down. That depends a little bit on the architecture. Sometimes that will adjust the win the system volume level, right? Whereas on these devices, on iOS, if you change the volume, actually something happens in your application. So your volume slider will get adjusted because your volume slider is hooked into the OS level notion of how loud something is. So that is a bit um, platform specific. Uh, Alt-F4. Alt-F4, yep. Alt-Tab is another one, right, for, um, for window switching. Eject to eject your disk drive. So there are plenty of events, um, and even the buttons to minimize and maximize windows, right? That is not logic that you wrote. It's something that the window manager um, so provided. And so the window manager handles the, those clicks, and it just translates into a window minimized or size changed event for you later on. All right, but let's say an event actually made it into your application. How, how does that happen? And so here's a key, lecture, a key slide from this lecture. All UI toolkits basically have a version of this event dispatch loop where an event comes in from hardware through the different OS layers and then enters an event queue. And this is usually a FIFO, first in, first out queue. Gets queued there. And then a separate process, which is the event loop, which usually runs in a dedicated thread just services that queue. So it says, OK, let me pick the event from the front of the queue. What's the event type? What component in my UI should I deliver this to? And then it invokes the callback functions for that event type on that component. That callback method then will update state, perform some computation, and may request a repaint. So for example, when you push a button, a toggle button, it goes from up to down state. You now have to repaint those pixels to show the button in the down state. Now the important part is the repaint is not performed in the event handler. All you do is you queue a request that you want your area to be repainted. And then you go back into the run loop, and the run loop then at the right time this take stock what areas of the screen have, have notified me that they need to be repainted, and then it does basically the minimal amount of work necessary to only repaint those areas. And so we have a level of abstraction, both in how input is delivered by putting a queue in between, and how painting is done by queuing repaint requests. 
All right. Uh, just to convince you that I didn't just make this up, so here's a slide from um, Cocoa applications from Apple, and there's a Windows server which sends events to a, a mock port. The port is basically the queue, adds an event to the end of the queue, and the main run loop um, then pops events off of the queue. So events from the device come through the Windows server, get added to the queue, and then the main run loop does one event per iteration. All right, so now the remaining question is how do we find the component to deliver the event to? So let's say you're, you, in our example, someone moved the mouse over the text area. Well, we have the XY location of the event. And so we traverse from the root of the tree down towards the leaves by bounding box and find, so basically, everything on that path to the leaf right, had, could potentially respond to this event, because its bounding boxes all contained that event. And the usual rule of thumb is that Mouse events are routed to the topmost in Z order, so frontmost from the user facing, um, visible component that's underneath the cursor. And how do you test for that? Well, you do hit testing, which in the 2D case is just bounding box checking. Are there any exceptions to mouse event handling when we would not want to deliver a mouse event to the topmost component underneath the mouse? So when might we want to send an event to a different component? Well, in the reading, it talks about like mouse focus for scroll bars, where your mouse Exactly. So there's a concept called mouse capture, which relates to Fitt's law right, of pointing accuracy. So you only have to be accurate to initiate an interaction, but then afterwards you can actually move off. Let's say if you have a vertical scroll bar, you can move off in the x direction. And your mouse event, is, as long as you're dragging, will still get delivered to, um, to the scroll bar. Yes? Um, just another example of when you don't want it to be in the top mode. Window like when you make something full screen, if you hover on the top, you get the option to make it not full screen anymore. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's once again, it's the window manager will actually take over, and they'll paint something over that says here's the small icon to to minimize again. So that's kind of related to the first one. If I have two windows open and one is focused, I might be able to still scroll on the other one if I just hover my mouse over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, um, that's right. So there are, um, there are basically usability tweaks where you don't have to activate a window at all. Um, mouse position for a scroll event is taken into account. Um, and so that allows you to retain focus while scrolling in, in, a, in an adjacent window. It turns out to be really handy. All right. Keyboard events are usually routed to the component that has key focus. So we talked about, it ta your reading talked about key focus, right? Keyboard, a key doesn't have a natural location on screen, so what are you going to hit test it against? So therefore you need a, a notion of focus that just says, if a character comes in, where should that character be delivered to? And clicking on something is one way to determine focus, but there are other ways as well. Okay. Are there any keyboard events that fall outside of the notion of delivering to the component that has key focus? There's one obvious one. Fine. Well, uh, there's there's many many hotkeys and which is kind of debatable. And uh, power or eject sleep. Yep, those never get to your application. 
But yeah, you're, you're right on track. So um, there's got to be a key that changes what has focus, right? Usually it's tab. So that doesn't get delivered to your component. It gets filtered out before. And then there are all the keyword shortcuts you define, which also don't get delivered to your component. They get delivered and handled basically as if you invoked a menu. And so here's just a, a simple example. Your application usually defines some kind of key focus list. You say, here's what gets key focus first. Here's the field that gets key focus next. And so usually with the tab key, you can traverse through those. And it's a way to accelerate using the UI without having to switch between on a desktop between mouse and keyboard. All right. So then there are abstracted events, um, such as, so mouse down is a more elementary event than double click. Right? Double click is an aggregation of multiple mouse downs with some timing constraint in between. Um, or moving a pen versus recognizing a gesture with a pen. So it can be different levels of abstraction. Um, and I just wanted to give you one example where um, you usually first deal with this in touch applications. Um, so let's say I tap twice on the display. How do I want to be, as an application developer, if the user taps twice, how do I want to be notified of that? Well, here's one option. I give you a first tap and then a double tap. Let's say I want to write a double tap recognizer, right? But actually, there's a bit of a problem in that I both get a tap and a double tap. And at the moment that I get the tap event, I don't yet know whether I'm in a double tap or not. And so either you have to write your application so that you never get into a bad state by incorrectly firing off a tap event handler while you're actually waiting for a double tap. Or you have to change how you're, how you're handling your events. So one way is you just, in, you just insert a timeout. Basically say, if you want to use double tap, we're going to wait that window between the first and the second tap. And if there's new, a new event within that window, we're just never going to send the tap to you. And we only send you the double tap. But there's a problem with that. Slow. We've now introduced mandatory latency of a double tap for every possible interaction in the system. But it's really simple for the programmer. Right? And so the other option is let the programmer deal with it, but give them extra information. So you just get touch down, touch up notifications. But either you have to maintain or the system provides you with extra information, such as given a particular delay for counting double taps, here's how many taps have occurred so far. And now, if you know as an application developer you don't need double taps, you can always handle the tap right here. And only in situations where on a component you know you have to also support double taps, you could request a tap with a delay that you can then cancel if something happens in between. And so this lower level of abstraction is usually what the input device frameworks give to you. It's more work, but it preserves the flexibility of having either low latency response or higher level abstractions. All right, just a quick implementation detail in Android. I think this is a this kind of confusing terminology, so I just wanted to bring it up. Uh, in the documentation, you'll probably see both event handlers and listeners. And the way those two terms are distinct is a bit unique to Android. I think in, in other sources, you may find them used more interchangeably. It's basically an event handler. Something's called an event handler. Um, it, it is 
the method that a widget, so a view-derived class itself, defines. So it's either the default behavior, or if you create a custom widget, right? then in that custom widget, you would override on key down or on touch event. And those methods are referred to as event handlers, whereas sometimes, or maybe even most frequently, you just want to put together existing components and be notified when something happens to them. So for example, you define your layout in an XML file, and then in your main activity, you just say, hey, please just call this method when something happens on this button or scroll bar. And so that, in Android, is referred to an event listener, where basically your own class requests that it be notified when something happens in a widget somewhere else. Right? So you're adding yourself as a listener to events that happen on that widget. And so this is probably the more common case that you'll run into. All right, um, I have a couple things to say about gestures, so how to go from simple input into continuous recognition of gesture. But I think in the interest of time, we'll just do that on Wednesday. So I'll just conclude by telling you that we'll deal with gestures, model view controllers, and threading on Wednesday. Um, don't forget your reading assignment. There's one really short one on the model view controller and a longer one on threading in Java, um, which directly applies to Android. Um, and then continue work on your programming assignment and your video prototype. <laughs>